All right. So welcome everyone. This is our Connect Sunday School class. Uh, this connecting is part of our mission statement. So we have a three-pronged mission statement, okay? What's the first part of our what's the first part of our mission statement? To know God, very good. This is Sunday school class. To know God, love and serve one another, and to engage the world. So this connection piece is related to the concept of, of loving one another, which is why we're having it here in the sanctuary today. So uh, before we get started, let me open with a word of prayer, uh, and I'll go over what we're going to be doing today. So let's pray. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you that in your love you have brought us into uh, communion with you and with the Father and with the Spirit, that uh, in our life with you, uh, we know what it means to live in community, and so you call us to live out that life with you in relationship with one another. Thank you, Lord, that you have included us as part of your church, part of your body, where we can learn more about who you are and why we've been put on this earth to receive healing and love from each other and how you use uh, Christians in our lives to transform us more and more into the image of Christ. Lord, we thank you that in your wonderful design, you've called us not to live in isolation or in separation, but in community with one another. So help us now in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so where I want to start is with a very practical question, which is, why do we need community? Why do we need community? And what's going on in society? Let me, before I answer that, first say, uh, for those of you, and, I, and I'm so used to being here at this point, I don't do this anymore, but my name is Andrew Zakari. I'm the assistant pastor here, uh, and part of my uh, pastoral oversight is over the small group ministry in our church, so that's why they, they put me up here to talk about this. I also am helped by someone that is really small group ministry on a, in a church this size wouldn't be possible. Uh, Aaron, Aaron Lee is there in the back. Uh, Aaron, do you want to say anything at this moment or when you come up? Yeah, she'll, she'll reserve the goods for later on. But anyway, that's, that's who I am. Okay, back to this first question of why do we need community. I want you to take a couple moments and to think about what are the most influential spiritual experiences you've had in your life? What are the most influential spiritual experiences you've had in your life? Maybe in coming to faith, being kept in the faith, or growing in the faith. Take a moment and think about some of those experiences you've had. Maybe the top three or four. How many of you, in those top three or four spiritual experiences that brought you to faith, nurtured your faith, involve the lives of other Christians. So the majority of people, and that is how Christ designed it. Because when Jesus was on earth, he didn't write scripture down with his own hand. What did he do to bring the life of God, the kingdom of God on earth? He established a community. Right? So community is at the very beginning of what it means to live out this Christian life. Now, transformation is only going to occur in our encounters with one another. You think about things that we read in Scripture, uh, the one another commands, love one another, encourage one another, care for, accept, be kind to, forgive one another, in order to do these one another commands, you need one another. Can't happen. Even something like the fruit of the Spirit, okay? This is the kind of way we naturally think as, as Christians in, North, in a North American context. When we hear love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and goodness and self-control, by and large, I think our normal reaction is to think that these qualities are about 
emotional uh, states that occur within us, primarily as individuals. So the feeling of love, right? The feeling of joy, right? The feeling of peace. But when you look at the fruit of the Spirit in context, these fruit are meant to be, uh, uh, to counteract the works of the flesh, which are dissensions, rivalry. In other words, Paul is saying that in order for the fruit of the Spirit to manifest, it, we need to be in communion with one another. That's what it means for love to flourish for goodness to flourish, for faithfulness to flourish. It presupposes that we're doing life together. Okay? Not so much individual characteristics in a person, but how this emerges when we spend time together as a church. Okay. So that's the, to answer the question, why do we need community? But it's also interesting to have this conversation now uh, in relation to what's going on in society. Uh, back in 2018, the UK appointed a minister of, does anyone know this, for the first time in its history? A minister of loneliness. Because loneliness has become a public health epidemic. And um, in 2022, there was an article published in the Times that, that, um, that said more adults struggle with loneliness than diabetes now than, than before. And just this past week in the Wall Street Journal, um, they had this article. They've been friends for 60 years. Lou and Bobby have figured out what me most men don't. Okay, so this is an article about this lifelong friendship between two guys named Lou and Bobby. Okay, and what's really interesting is when you get into this article, uh, I believe it's Lou. Lou is what, you know, what the article identifies as a conservative evangelical. Okay. And, and, and I've looked into this a little bit more, but there's something about developing a relationship with God that makes us better to be in relationship with other people. Doesn't that make sense? If you grow in your love for God and you're able to confess your sin and you're able to receive mercy and forgiveness, this opens up your heart to relate to other people. It connects you to them. And that's exactly how it's meant to be. And our society is starting to acknowledge, boy, we really need to be in community, right? Even from a secular perspective. Um, so what I wanna point out is that community, particularly in what we're gonna be talking about in small groups and connection groups, meets a human need, but you know what else it is? It's countercultural. It's countercultural to intentionally be invested in the lives of other people and to grow in, in, in spiritual formation is counter to what, how most people in culture live. So if we talk about being a witness to Christ, doing this is a way to be a witness for Christ in today's world. Okay, let's now look at what scripture has to say before I invite uh, Aaron to come up in just a couple minutes to talk to us. So what does scripture say? So three passages there, are really, I mean, really, we could almost quote any part of the New Testament. Very famously, Acts 2, 42, this is right after Pentecost and the community of the church is forming and the Holy Spirit descends. It says this about the church, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Ephesians 5, when it talks about life in the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father uh, for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So how do you know a person is filled with the Spirit? This is what they do in a community. This is how they act. Lastly, 1 Thessalonians 2.8 in 1 Thessalonians, many people believe is the first letter of the, of the first book of the New Testament written, okay? So this is right from the gate from Paul's, uh, from Paul's mouth. So we cared for you because we loved you so much and we're delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, okay? 
So fundamentally what we're doing is not simply trying to disseminate a message, get a word out about something, but part and parcel of getting that word out is the giving of our lives to one another, to people. Okay, that's what it means. Okay, so that's sort of the, the, the biblical foundation that we have there. Now, what's the biggest barrier to living this out in our context today? Go ahead, shout it out. Don't be shy. What's the biggest barrier to living in Christian community and connecting to small groups today in, in our church? Time. Time. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. I'm pretty busy. Isn't Sunday morning enough? Okay. So, if you think about how habits are formed over time, um, we are functionally in a worship service for about, depending on who's preaching, an hour and 15 minutes to an hour and a half, okay? That was not a dig, that was just an observation, a neutral observation, okay? So, so the challenge is that in a worship service, uh, it by and large falls uh, on the shoulders of a few people. And when we think about what worship was like in the early church, in the New Testament, there were certainly the things that we do on a Sunday morning, but the experience of it was much different in the sense that they met at homes. They met in living rooms or, or in porches or colonnades or things like that, right? So the, so the believers were connected to one another in a much more personal way. When we read a book like 1 Corinthians, okay, and we read about all the problems that that church had, many, many problems, right? Chapter after chapter, Paul's laying out all these problems. Think about it for, this, think about it for a moment. Paul knew, and the church knew one another so well, they knew about these problems in each other's lives, right? So, when we look at the model of what the New Testament offers for life together, it's not coming to a worship service merely, but rather the unfolding of our lives with one another. Let me read to you this definition or, or, or this statement about what groups are supposed to be doing in the life of the church. This is just one way to put it. Groups are the primary way to be discipled, to connect with and live life in community with others. They create a community, an environment in which we can move toward Jesus. God uses community to change us to become more dedicated followers of Jesus. Okay, so to address this problem of I'm too busy or I don't have time, what we've tried to do over the years is devise certain kinds, different kinds of groups to meet people where they are, not just in terms of where they live, um, but in terms of their time commitments as well. So let me go over those, what those three kinds of groups are in the life of our church. So we have, first and foremost, I want to start with the middle one there, traditional small groups. And Chris and Debbie right now are going to talk uh, at the end of our presentation, are going to tell us a little bit about a traditional small group. This traditional small group is a group of uh, a few families or some individuals, usually between six to eight people, that meet in a home, uh, maybe weekly, maybe twice a month, and they live the Christian life together, pray together, share a meal maybe, look at scripture, apply the scripture to their lives, offer encouragement to one another, follow up with each other about how we're doing. That's a traditional small group. And you can do that studying a book of the Bible. We have sermon uh, discussion questions so that you know, no extra preparation is uh, required ahead of time. That's the traditional small group. We have groups like that in our church. Last year, we started what we call connection groups. Connection groups. And this essentially is bringing just two people or two families in the church together who have the same availability and who want to grow in their discipleship as a unit. So it, look, it might look like any number of things, and Aaron's going to talk a little bit about that shortly. And lastly, we do have special topic care groups. So for instance, we have a divorce recovery group. Uh, we do have a grief share group that is starting tomorrow. Uh, we do also have men's groups and women's groups. That's another way of sort of getting at this community life. 
Okay, I'm going to hand it over to Erin. She's going to talk to you more about connection groups. Good morning. Um, so yes, again, I'm Erin Lee. Uh, I'm on staff here at the church office. Uh, the way I explain it to people is if you have a pastoral or theological question, contact Pastor Andrew. <laughs> if you have a question about anything else, contact me. <laughs> um, even if it doesn't have to do with small groups, I'll point you in the right direction. Um, Okay, so yes, connection groups. We started connection groups uh, last year around this time, um, and we've had um, a few matches made where people have started getting together, have been meeting for some time, um, and I think we, we had a testimony about that maybe in the winter. Um, if you wanted to see that testimony again, I could share it with you, um, the, the video. Um, so this is a very flexible option. That's how I like to explain connection groups. Um, it's maybe more flexible than a traditional small group. Connection groups are more flexible than a small group um, because it is uh, less, less people to try to coordinate with, um, but you can still create community and grow together as disciples of Christ. Um, so this is for anyone, whether you're single, married, maybe you have a young family, Maybe you have older kids and they're out of the house. Um, for anyone, um, a connection group could be a good, uh, a good fit for you, a good solution, particularly if you have a very busy schedule. Um, so here's how it would work. You would sign up. You can sign up using the link that's right there or in your handout, or you can contact me to express interest. Um, and then you would give us a few details about yourself to help us um, make an appropriate connection. Um, and then we would contact you with uh, one individual or one other small family. Um, and then you would talk to each other and you could coordinate your schedules um, and you could come up with a plan to meet regularly for fellowship and discipleship in a way that works for you. So here's a few examples of how it could look. Um, you might arrange to meet for a meal every other week, share a little bit about how your week went and then pray together. That, that could be what works for you. Uh, or maybe you have some young kids and you need something that, you know, it's okay to be noisy with. <laughs> um, so you could do a family-friendly devotional together um, and then have a short discussion around it. Um, maybe if your circumstances allow for it, you could have a Bible study with another believer. Um, and we have resources available to help you do that. Um, so you could contact me and I could let you know. Uh, what resources are available. They're also here in your packet um, if you read further on. Um, so the point of connection groups is the format can be really varied. Um, it's, there's not one set way to do it, um, but the goal is the same for any connection group, and that's to grow intentionally um, in your Christian walk, in your discipleship, in community with someone else or with one other family. So again, if you're interested, you can talk to us or go to the link that's there. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, um, at this moment, let me, let me ask the question, does anyone have any questions about what we've talked about so far? About why we have small groups, the kinds of small groups we have available? Okay, let me, let me go back to the issue of... Uh, uh, small groups. Now, um, we need, v very practically speaking, uh, let's, let's just look at what a small group might, might look like. So typically eight or more people, as I said, and there's different uh, kinds of groups depending on your demographic, male or female. Even Awana uh, is an opportunity to connect with other families and growth. There's youth groups. So we're looking at this in sort of a big picture sort of way. In, in terms of a small group ministry. Let's go to the next slide there, Nathaniel. Um, so that's a sample of what a small group could look like. Again, it's, it's just intentionally being with one another as Christians. Okay, why do I say it like that? Because sometimes it's easy to sort of settle for just hanging out and spending time with each other. That's really good and important, but, but there's some basic things that we, that we wanna be doing when we are together. Among those things are praying and hearing God's word and discussing it and, and encouraging one another. Let's go to the next slide, Nathaniel. So what we're asking you to do before we uh, bring up Chris and Debbie to talk about their small group, what we are asking you to do 
is to participate, first of all, join a small group that exists already. So we have groups that are closed because the size of them are too big, but we also have a number of groups that are open, okay? Another major need would be to host a small group, meaning you're not really sure if you're the kind of person that would like leading a discussion around the Bible. Uh, maybe, maybe doing group presentations is, is something that you're not quite ready to do yet in any way. So, so opening up your home is actually a huge part of this ministry. So if you're willing to do that, uh, please let us know so that we can try to, to try to form a group at, at your home starting this fall. And lastly, uh, facilitation. We need people who would be maybe willing to lead the discussions, be seen as someone who kind of uh, knows the attendance of the group, communicates to the church about what's going on. We, we need those sorts of uh, individuals as well. So there's lots of opportunity to get connected in, in our church. And I really want to encourage you this year, that's why we're starting this in September, to make that commitment so that you can deepen your life here at the church as, you, as we all follow Jesus. Right now, I want to invite Chris and Debbie Daniel to share about their small group, and, and you're going to uh, really love to hear what God has done through them over the years. Chris and Debbie have been at it for a while, and they have a wonderful group, so we're delighted that they're here to share. Who goes first? I say. Absolutely, she'll fix it. All right, well, uh, let me set a couple of things down here. Too many things in my hands. Okay. Uh, a very well loved Bible. <laughs> yes, it is. Very well loved. All right. So, um, first off, it's, uh, it's a privilege to be talking with each of you. As uh, Pastor Andrew mentioned, uh, small groups have really been a, a kind of a core part of Debbie and I, of our life together. We've been married for 30 years. And I would probably say that we have been active in some form of small group or another and particularly home groups probably for 20 to 25 years of that and most of those have been in facilitating and leading so we are really sold out that this is a, a instrumental part of what it means uh, for you to be connected to the church and to grow together um, so as we look at this today we're going to kind of break up how we're going to talk about this a little bit because um, as Pastor Andrew mentioned, right, the three parts of the church, there's, there's no God, there's love others, there's engage the world. And we were talking to our own small group and we asked them the question, if you were going to be sitting in, in this audience and you wanted to know about small groups, what would be the primary thing? And, and the first answer was, you get lost in the big church. How do you develop relationships is the first piece of what most people need to understand. And as Debbie, as the more loving and nurturing of the two of us, she probably has a little bit more of the relational side of this, the care side of this, and she's going to talk to those pieces with you and our experiences with those. I would probably say my experience probably fits a little bit on the other side of the teaching and discipleship and growth in the word and the use of your spiritual gifts. And so those fit into the other pieces, though, the know God and the engage the world side of it. So even within a small group, it is the primary nucleus of by which you can apply and learn and use all three of those key aspects of the church. So even through this Sunday school series where you're talking about those three pieces, a small group is one of the best ways to actually apply all three of those pieces. So I'm gonna turn it over to Debbie. We'll probably ping pong back and forth a little bit in our stories and experiences, but I'm gonna let her kind of talk about the, the relational and care aspects. As Chris says, we kind of tag team our small group, um, and we kind of tag team, I think, as a married couple, life, which is what we're supposed to do. But um, I'll just give you a little overview of how we do small group in our house. Um, we meet, it's in the book, Friday nights at 7 o'clock. We have fellowship first, in which I bake a dessert, and we hang out for a little while, talk, um, kind of decompress, because it's Friday night. 
and everybody's had long weeks, you've been working, you've been doing, you know, whatever, childcare, family running around, school, busy, you're just busy. Gives us a time of to decompress, get those things out, talk about it, and then we break up into small group women and men for prayer. And this is where we talk about more deep things as we break up, maybe some things, um, we have single people in our, in our group as well, things that maybe don't want to be shared in front of the other sex for some reason or, or you know, for any reason that uh, something might be for the single people, more private, that they don't want it shared. Um, and then we pray. Um, we tend to, that's probably the part that tends to go over because we share a lot and we enjoy that, but we really know that the people around us are going to pray for us, and that is so important. Um, and then once we're, we break up from there, we do our, our teaching time, and Chris takes over, and um, we're getting ready to study the book of Hebrews, if anyone is interested in that. And... Um, uh, we just make sure everybody's comfortable. We do those sort of things. Um, one woman, one of the members of our group, happened to be a woman, woman, said one of the things that she appreciates most with Chris when he starts to teach is we tend to take a moment that we don't, it's funny, we share so much, I think, in prayer time, and then they're quiet in the teaching time. And so it takes a moment for somebody to, to say, answer something he may ask. And he's we're willing to just sit there in the silence until somebody finally feels the Lord say, speak. And so um, it's a really good working. Sometimes I will say we do in this model go three hours. So we tend. We try to get out by 930, but I'll be honest, three hours. Just plan till 10, 7 to 10, because we talk too much when we're sharing in prayer time. But as well as once people get talking about the scripture, it is um, an excellent period of time to um, to discuss and to talk, and um, the Lord brought to my mind Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen. you know, iron sharpens iron. And so it's so key and so important to be in a community, as well as if you realize, you know, God is in community. He's not alone. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are community, and we're meant to be in community. We've been, we've been made to be in community. And so... Um, we can, we can discuss and we sharpen each other. Um, just a couple of examples real quick is, um, you know, we've had a, a year of health issues in our small group, and it has been um, really good to be able to be there for one another to one of the ladies was single, needed rides to the hospital, needed food, different things after treatments that she was having, and um, it's good to know that you have somebody that knows what's going on in your life. You know, the, the, the one thing with the church, unless you tell the church what's going on, the church doesn't know. It's not, it's not a bad thing. It's just there's so many people that you can live isolated sometimes. And that's why you really do need the church, the community of a, of a small group, to know that when these things pop up and you're in the middle of them, there's somebody there who knows. And we can connect to the church and have the church help as well. But there's already somebody there who knows you and knows uh, what's going on in your life and can help you through those things. So those are some of the things I don't know if you want to add. Or... Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, one of the things if you're, if you're not really plugged into the church and you, uh, you just come on Sunday morning, one of the most intimidating things, I think, is our, our social time out in the lobby, right? Because you're like, who am I supposed to talk to? Who do I know? You know, those kind of things. And, and it's a good and a bad thing in some ways because your small group starts to become your church family, right? And so, so you automatically have built-in relationships on Sunday of people that you're going to feel comfortable with, that you're going to, to know, you're going to, you know, you're going to love. They're going to, they're going to come check on you on Sunday morning as well and see how things are going. But as I said, it's a little bit of a two-edged sword because you'll sometimes almost see they're too comfortable together. 
right? Because sometimes uh, it's one of the things that I, I find myself saying is sometimes I have to be careful that I'm not spending so much time only visiting with my small group people that I forget to say hello to new people and things like that. So you have to be a little bit careful um, about that as well. But, but the thing is, um, there's an expression that says it's a place to, um, to know and be known, right? You know other people. You really know what's going on in their lives. You care about them. And at the same time, you have somewhere that you can feel comfortable sharing what's going on in your life, physical, spiritual, emotional, because, you know, life's hard. You need other people to, to, to carry that with you. One of the other things I just want to mention, just in small groups in general, or being in a Bible study, or finding your place, you know, um, we talk on Sunday morning many times about how to live life, how to, you know, what God, but how do you really know God, and how do you really know what God, how God wants you to live if you don't read the manual? <laughs> the manual he's given us to tell us how to proceed in this life. And so I would encourage you, whether it be our small group, whether it be a women's Bible study, whether it be wherever, plug in and get to know God because um, then it'll help. Uh, as Pastor Tracy almost preached, you know, just preached the message today. You know, you need to know God so you know where God wants you to go and where God wants you to be and where God wants you to participate. And so in order to do that, you really need to know who God is and get into his word. And so it's just, I would encourage you to, to consider and to do that. And, uh, you know, I'll be honest, I'm not perfect. I'm not in the Word every day. But I do try to be in the Word and pray and, and, and ask God, really, you know, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Give me your wisdom and help me to, to understand your Word so that I can glorify you in my life. When somebody looks at me, who do they see? Do they see this, the, the worldly or do they see the godly? And I pray and I hope that more often than not, they see the godly. So um, it's just, you know, hopefully you'll, you'll consider plugging in somewhere to get into the word of God. All right, with that, well, I'll go ahead. I'm going to bridge for just a second over to the other kind of two points. What I see is the other two major values of participating in a small group. And it leads exactly off of what Debbie was just saying. And I'm going to ask you a question real quick, and I want you to actually raise your hand. Who considers themselves that your primary, your best way to learn is only orally, to listen to someone else? Who considers that to be their best way of learning? Good. I've got an honest group of people here where zero people raised. There was one? There was one. All right, one. So, have you guys ever heard of a gentleman by the name of Ebbinghaus or Ebbinghaus? If you study learning, there's something called the uh, Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. It basically says that within one hour, you will forget 50% of what you just learned. I know that's really disappointing to pastors. They spend so much time preparing sermons. You get one hour, and, and it's a curve, which means that you're going to forget the rest of it very, very quickly. So if you study learning, what is the better way to learn? The better way to learn is what they call active learning, right? Active learning basically means you're going to engage in the learning topic. And some of the ways you do that is, I would say, discuss, debate, and apply, Right? You're basically going to look at, your, at what you're trying to learn and you're going to try to actually figure out what it means and you're going to try to figure out what does it mean to me. It's one of the hardest things about Sunday morning, right? And this is kind of the theme of the day. If you're only coming on Sunday, you may get a great feel good. You may get an emotional high. You may get a spiritual high and you may say, wow, that was a really great message. And an hour later, if somebody asks you what it was, you'll kind of go, uh, <laughs> I don't remember. But when you're trying to sit down with other people and you're going to try to figure out, there's major, massive benefits of studying the Word of God together. The first thing is it requires you to actually engage your mind in discussion. You're going to actually get to be able to do deeper thinking, right? 
And so some of the things that I find in this, and I call it the, uh, the benefit of other people's perceptions and the benefits of others' um, insights. As a teacher, one of the things that I try to do is I try to, I really try to dig through the word and figure out if I understand what it means. I am constantly amazed when I ask the question of, what do you think about this passage? What do you think it means? How do you apply it? The difference of perspectives within a small group are so different. Some people are gonna come at it from an intellectual perspective. Some are gonna come after it from a theological perspective. Some from a relational, some from a um, care, some from a systematic perspective. And when people start talking about how they think about the word, you hear it and you learn it in ways that you never would have done on your own. So even if you're just doing your own devotionals, even if you're just trying to, if you're good and consistent about doing devotionals on a daily perspective, you learn so much more by hearing this from other perspectives. And the other thing that's really critically important about studying together as groups, if you're, if you're wise and you're systematic about it, you're gonna think about how do I apply it? And in good small groups, they're gonna actually take the time to ask that question. What are you gonna do as a result of what have you learned? And that gives you the opportunity then in that small group, in those trusted relationships to say, hey, did you apply it? You have other, you shared what you wanna do as a result of learning that and you have other people that can hold you accountable and actually ask you that question in a safe way. How did you do? Did you actually go do what you said? And, and in our group, that is something that we try very, very hard um, to do. I will tell you my own story is um, it's these times of, of looking deeply at the word of trying to figure out how to apply it. That's my own testimony that over the years those have been some of the, the most central ways which God has developed my faith and developed my maturity is through these types of discussions and through these types of interactions. Um, anything you'd want to add on that? I got it. All right. So the last one in the spirit of time, I'm going to hit this one just a little bit more quickly, is kind of um, in this um, love others, engage the world. Even in small groups, what you're going to find is there's various roles. In order for small groups to work well and you want to apply your spiritual gifts, there's great opportunities for you to, to serve your groups. Um, obviously, um, teachers, facilitators, hosts, those fit into the spiritual gifts, particularly of things like teaching and hospitality, but there's also great needs for things like administration. There really is the coordination of activities, the coordination of communication, um, things like that. There's, as we just talked about with this last year, we had three different people in our group that were in very serious need of care. And so we had multiple opportunities of how we were able to organize resources and people um, in terms of making sure that those care needs were met, uh, physical needs, prayer needs, communication needs. People wanted to know what was going on with those people and you need to be able to coordinate those things. Other, um, within these kind of small groups, we do service projects, right? We've gone out, we've done things at food banks. We coordinated uh, when Manville had the floods, going up and doing flood relief. We've coordinated um, going to a, uh, yeah, actually we did a bunch of work here at the church. We've done, we've done all sorts of different things. And so there's opportunities of doing outreach, service projects, evangelism projects. There's all sorts of opportunities for you to use your spiritual gifts within the these little smaller communities of people. So I think that's what I'd wanna share. Do you wanna take a, we got five minutes left. If people have questions, I think Pastor Andrew gave the theology and they gave the administrative side of this. We're kind of given the practical and experiential side. Any other kind of questions that people would, would have about maybe getting involved in a small group? Please. You can speak loud. All right, go ahead. Okay, good question. 
Yeah. I will. Conflicts? Okay. Um, I will take a crack at this, and I'll give uh, Pastor Aaron, or Pastor Andrew and Aaron both a, a chance to respond as well. Different groups are very different as far as stability and time. Um, I will say our group in particular, just as an example, we've been together, I think, for about eight years now. Uh, the core group of this has been with us all the way from the beginning. We've got about four to five couples that have been with us almost for eight years solid. We've had all sorts of other people in and out of the group for various and different reasons. Um, an example, we had a, a, a couple that came out of Princeton University, got married, um, and they just recently, you know, moved up to Ithaca, you know. So we've had, we've had younger couples that have been with us in stage of life and things like that. We've had multiple couples whose jobs have moved them away over time. But, you know, that's... That's kind of, again, we know within Princeton that is part of what it means to live in this area. It's a fairly transient community. So we do have people in and out. Um, but you're really kind of looking for, in a lot of the, the small group leadership, to try to act as the nucleus to hold these groups together. Aaron, Pastor Andrew, anything you'd want to add to that? I would say that just, just aim for consistency and that, that's what gives life to the group and uh, sustains it over the long haul. I do want to add something. One of the things that helps us stay stable, I think, is we don't cancel. We meet every other Friday, 7 p.m., rain or shine, whatever. And whether two couples come, whether one couple comes, we don't, we don't cancel because it gets to be too easy to then say, oh, Next time, if it's only two couples, we'll just cancel again. Or we'll just do this again. And, and you don't develop consistency. And so we, have, from the beginning, really said, no, we want it to stay consistent. And so um, we, don't, we don't cancel. We, we have it. You know, and everybody knows when it is, where it is, and be there if you can. And, and just that's, where it's go that's what's going to happen. So we really try. I mean, unless both of us were sick on our deathbeds or something, that might not happen. But, but for the most part, yes, we stay, we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we stay consistent. So. All right. I do. I'm going to quickly answer because I'm going to try to let's get some other questions as well. Is it okay if I take your second question afterwards? Okay. Let me ask, take a couple other questions. Yes, yes. So to answer that in kind of a roundabout way, if you want to find a small group in your area that is open, we have this pamphlet at the welcome desk. We have many more small groups than what are listed here, but these are the small groups that are open. So you can look for one that is in your area. There's also a small groups finder on our website that has the same information in it. So you can put in an area that you're interested in and find a small group that is in your area. We don't have printed address books, that is true. I don't know why that decision was made, that was before I started working here, but I know people have a lot of privacy concerns. I also know that if you use the loop, which is our main tool for, uh, kind of our main directory tool that we use here at the church, um, everyone can have a loop account, and you can find people's contact information. So if you're looking to, you know, you want to email Debbie and ask her a question, then you can look up Debbie's name in the loop and you can see her, her email address if, if she has chosen to list it, and then you can contact her. Um, that's the best I can answer that question right now. Yeah, I, I was gonna look that up. Okay, sure. Uh, slightly, slightly different topic, but parishes. Um, parishes are a way of organizing the membership of our church. So if you are a member here at Stonehill, if you've gone through the membership process, then you are placed into a parish. Parish, there's maybe 12 parishes. Um, each one has an elder overseeing it. Um, and that's a sort of a smaller subdivision of the membership of the church. 
A lot of them are geographically based, so it's people who live around you. Um, and a lot of the parishes will have um, social events. They'll get together for a picnic to help, one, help you get to know other people in your parish. Um, the elder of that parish will often, you know, send out an email and follow up with people. How are you doing? How can I be praying for you? Keep, keeping up with the people in their parish and um, things like that. So parishes, if you're a member here, parishes can be another way to um, kind of be a, what? To kind of know who lives around you geographically, yes. Now, I know one of the things we do for small group is we do ask everybody and then we give them address and phone numbers if for some people, because I do realize I've had a lot of people in various leaderships say, I don't like the loop, I don't use the loop, how do I find out how people are? Um, and so I would say also too, I would guarantee if you called the church office, someone would help you find somebody's information um, or at least be able, willing to call and ask them if it's okay if they share their information with you. Um, and I, I, was, I thought at one time, and you can correct me, that Mary Ann, maybe you could call her and because uh, I had wanted at one time to get a list of people who are in Hillsboro and that the loop has a way, but I think you have to be a certain administrator of the loop to pull that up. And so you can get that information from the church because um, we were going to do, you know, see if there were more people to invite from our Hillsboro area to our small group. And um, so I think you can call the office and get that and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Now, we're at 17, should we quit, or can I take another question? Uh, if you do have a question, come in, talk to me, or Chris, or Debbie, whoever, or Aaron, um, and we're going to close our time uh, this morning so we can get ready for the next service. So thank you all for being here. Uh, glad, glad that you were a part of it. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for uh, just this wonderful testimony and... Uh, from Chris and Debbie, and we do thank you for all our small groups in our church and for each person here, whether they are a part of a group or not yet. We, we pray that uh, you would use the ministry of this church to grow people more into the likeness of Christ. So, Lord, we lift up this ministry to you and ask your blessing upon it. In Jesus' name, amen.